All right, we're ready to go. Uh, thank you, very, ladies and gentlemen, very much for being here at the 45th Annual Cancer Control Society Convention, uh, Labor Day weekend 2017, uh, the lovely Hilton Hotel in Glendale, California. Uh, our next presenter, Dr. Brad Weeks, uh, had a thriving medical practice. Uh, he, I believe, can truly be classified as one of the pioneers in the integrative health movement. Uh, I think we've known each other 20, 25, 30 years, something like that. Uh, it's been my pleasure to introduce him uh, at, at this, from this podium uh, many times, and we've also shared experiences at a lot of conferences around the country where uh, he works at, also as an educator, and we're very happy to have him back this year and slightly different topic, uh, but very exciting. Thank you, Th right. Brad, thank you for being here. Greetings, everybody. My pleasure. Well, uh, I'm going to talk today about oncoimmunology, but I'm going to clarify that that's going to be something you guys already know all about, but in many instances we've forgotten it. So the first thing, as a medical doctor, for the past 25 years, I focused on enhancing immune systems of patients and empowering them so that they can fight cancer effectively. And it was a delightful and challenging experience. During that process, I injected intravenous DMSO into people, and I have to tell Dr. Royal he has to open the windows when he does that because that stinks afterwards, but it's very effective. I also am one of the three doctors in America who is certified to teach insulin potentiation therapy to other doctors. So I've been in the thick of conventional and integrative oncology for many years. It was not my training, but it's what needed to be done. It's what I stepped up and did. So for the purposes of this talk today, we'll talk about oncoimmunology, but I wanna start by orienting us. I'm gonna give you one celebration. I'm gonna give you two announcements, three surprises, and four solutions. Are you ready? 45 years. Can we celebrate Lorraine and Frank for doing this for 45 years? They are a light. They are a beacon. And to me, that's astonishing. So good for them and good for all the people supporting them. Now, the first announcement is that, indeed, cytotoxic chemotherapy and radiation have passed. May they rest in peace. Now, do, I am not kidding. The only reason a doctor today recommends chemo and radiation is not because of the science. It's because of this juggernaut of a billion dollar economic machine that cannot turn on a dime. But I've talked to oncologists around the world and they say chemotherapy and radiation therapy are on the way out to be replaced by oncoimmunology, enhancing the immune system, and anti-inflammation. Now, chemotherapy was born in 1943 in, in the Barry Harbor in Italy. If you're not familiar with that situation, there was an explosion on a, uh, on a boat during World War, and the mustard gas went in the water, and the sailors had to swim for their lives, and they died of terrible burns. And the autopsy showed that the mustard gas had suppressed certain immune function cells. And so that's how chemotherapy was born at Yale University. Um, in uh, 1943, right afterwards, they started giving cytotoxic chemotherapy to suppress certain cells. Radiation therapy was born in 1898. Marie Curie, who got two Nobel Prizes, one for physics, one for chem chemistry, she discovered radium and she discovered its effect, and um, that also is disappearing in 2017. So may they rest in peace. Now, those are the stories. What's interesting is that on the right, you'll see that uh, Marie Curie's um, notebook is still so radioactive that it has to be contained in lead boxes. And she died, of course, of uh, aplastic anemia. So in the context of this lecture, I'm going to go relatively fast on the slides because when people look at the video, they can stop and study them. I want to get the information out there, uh, but I don't want to try to persuade you as I go along. I just want to give you my uh, opinion on all this. So here is Max Witcher, a guru, a friend, a wonderful teacher of mine. He is currently 
no longer crying in the wilderness, but he's on the National Cancer Advisory Board. And he told me last year in a private conversation, in my lifetime, and you can see that he's not a spring chicken, but in my lifetime, he said, oncologists will no longer use radiation or chemotherapy. Now, I'm telling you, it's already happening. It's just economics. It's not science. If you were going to have a scientific discussion with your oncologist, she or he could not justify human radiation. But you can't, that's the standard of care. You can't, if you, if you violate the standard of care as a doctor, you get in trouble. So, repeat after me, okay? Friends don't let friends get chemotherapy and radiation. Tell them to do the research. Because any oncologist will say, well, we're doing chemo and radiation, but there are some studies over there with oncoimmunology. Go over there to get some studies on anti-inflammatory agents. Now, why will friends not let friends do chemo and radiation? Because as Dr. Witch has said, chemotherapy and radiation make your cancers worse. Nobody told you that. Well, I told you that last year and the year before and the year before, but your oncologist in informed consent should say that. And again, this is not an alternative doctor. This is an august professor. He says it makes your cancer worse. Now, I'm not going to go into why that is because that's been some prior lectures I've given and I'm going to give you the references on that. That's not my topic today. But we do know that cancer is a messenger and we know that it's trying to correct a problem which exists and that there are anti-inflammatory and oncoimmunology agents. Anytime someone wants to target your tumor, they're asking the wrong question. They're saying, how can I shrink this tumor? The tumor is never the problem unless it's growing to obstruct the vital organ. It's the metastatic process which kills us. So you have to go after the cancer stem cells, not the cancer tumor cells. Anytime an oncologist says, we're going to go get your tumor, say, what are you going to do about my cancer stem cells? Again, not the topic of this lecture. This is something, if you get the tape or whatever, you can study this, or if you email me, I'll send you these lectures. But this is very clear. It is no longer a hypothesis that the real target should be the cancer stem cell. The giants in oncology are on board with this. It's just the bureaucrats, the oncologists, you know, earning their bread and butter with chemo and radiation. They're the ones that haven't switched yet. So the revolution in cancer care is that chemotherapy and radiation make your cancer worse. You need to befriend and listen to the messenger, which is the cancer. You need to target the cancer stem cells, and you need to nourish the immune system, spirit, soul, and body. Now, I mentioned the juggernaut. Please remember this truism. If the solution in medicine is not profitable, the problem does not exist. Unless there's money that can be made on fixing a problem, no one's going to call it to your attention or offer it. And cancer is inexpensive to fix. And I'm going to go through that. So the announcement, I was going to give you these three announcements. Number two announcement is that the future of cancer care is what I call sensible, dollars and cents, pennies. It's safe, effective, and it's cost effective, and it involves immune enhancement and anti-inflammation. This month, in a wonderful magazine called Fast Company, I saw this ad. These are wonderful words. There were those who believed the body could never fight cancer. Never say never. This is a beautiful ad saying the body can fight cancer if you just help it, right? Well, who put this ad out, folks? Did you see this? America's biopharmaceutical companies. Do you see that disconnect? It should be your grandmother putting this ad out. But the biopharmaceutical companies are now pitching immune-enhancing agents. In the world of oncology, where money talks, it actually screams. So here's the ad. So now Big Pharma is able to make money on immune-enhancing agents, and so they're pitching it, and the tide will shift away from chemo and radiation to anti-inflammatories and oncoimmunology, and you can buy their uh, $94,000 pills to enhance your immune system, or their $9,000 a month pills, because insurance will cover those, or you can just do what your grandmother has been telling you to do all along, take care of yourself, nourish your immune system. Here's a medical bill, advertising 800, lobbying 1,200, and so forth. At the very bottom, they give you an aspirin for $2, 
Folks, if you Google aspirin and cancer, you'll see that aspirin lowers the risks of every cancer and enhances the improvement of every cancer. The problem is if you take too much of it, you'll bleed out and die. Like all over-the-counter over over anti-inflammatories, they have a narrow therapeutic window. But the anti-inflammatories are the answer. Now, friends don't let friends get chemotherapy. Three surprises. Cancer is not aggressive. Cancer is a healing gesture, and only the body heals. Chemotherapy never heals. Radiation never heals. Only the body heals. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to substantiate these arguments here. Cancer is not aggressive. I would hope you would review these slides in some detail, but Rudolf Steiner said something very interesting. He said, the psychic influence of our environment is responsible for turning a predisposition into an illness. The chemical, physical, biological, genetic factors can cause an illness only if there is a psychic predisposition. This is in a wonderful book called Blessed by Illness. How's that for a title? Now, it's not aggressive. And also, genetic aberrations are really the consequence of cancer and not the cause. Now, I've just pulled the rug out from underneath the biggest growth industry in cancer. Don't go chasing your tail and try to get genetic therapy. Aberrant genes in cancer are the result of the cancer, not the cause. Why do we not blame ambulances at the scene of an accident? Because we know they're there to help. If I were to knock this tumor off of the tree, would I have cured the tree of tumor? No, why do we think lumping, lopping off a breast will take care of the cancer? Cancer is a process. It's not an illness. This is what my friend G. Edward Griffin said very elegantly yesterday. You can't cut it out. It's not an it, it's a process. Now, cancer is also an autoimmune illness, so here's the secret. Don't take sides with the cancer. Take sides with yourself. Don't feed yourself negative talk and such. Who doesn't get cancer? Schizophrenics. Lowest incidence of cancer of any major population of, of ailments, right? Sociopaths rarely get cancer because they have no guilt. They don't, they don't beat themselves up, so cut it out. Being resentful and angry is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to suffer and perish. Um, don't be with someone who makes you happy. Be someone who makes you happy. This is oncoimmunology at its essence. Why do we forget what we learned in kindergarten? It's not whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game. Why do we forget that when someone says you have cancer and we all of a sudden get afraid and make stupid decisions? This quality is more important than quantity. Now, I'm gonna suggest that we all understand that we are indeed spiritual beings having an earthly existence. So don't take your eye off the ball, don't get confused. It's not how long you live, it's how you live. Now, Cancer is a healing gesture. This is hard pill to swallow. But every symptom is a healing gesture according to Samuel Hahnemann. This is a wonderful statue in Washington, D.C. I, I consider like a, a shrine I go to on a regular basis. Every symptom is a healing gesture. Diarrhea. Well, we get upset with diarrhea, but it keeps us alive if we have something wrong with us. Or throwing up, if you swallow some poison, thank God you throw up because you throw up the poison. Symptoms are a healing gesture. Cancer is a symptom. The illness or the disease is something we have to pay attention to. The last thing there is fever. I remember when I was on, first working on the cancer wards as a medical student, I got called at two in the morning and the, the doctor said, you gotta go up, Mr. Jones is spiking a fever. Well, my job is to go up and give him antibiotics and suppress that fever, and it killed me because I knew that his spiking of fever was his immune system rallying. It's like he's coming up from air from drowning, and I'm pushing his head down again by, by suppressing that fever. So, so be aware that your body is much smarter than you are, and if it has a symptom it's trying to, take to it cause you to pay attention to, pay attention. Now, Stephanie Seneff, at booth 300C, buy her book. She is brilliant, she is courageous, she's an MIT professor, and she says, I have a very simple explanation of why cancer cells do what they do. The tumor is cleaning up the excess glucose from the blood and replacing it with an abundance of lactate to provide usable fuel for the critical organs like the heart and the brain. This is one reason why the tumor is part of the solution instead of part of the problem. Stephanie Seneff. 
Now, surprise number three, only the body heals. It kills me that people give up their autonomy and think some drug will fix the problem. Now, this is one of my great teachers. This is Tenjin Chodrak, my wife Laura on the left, the Dalai Lama's personal physician in the middle, 1986, when we visited in, um, to study Tibetan medicine in Dharamsala. And he told me that the most e experienced and, and well-respected new monk every year, the best monk student for the first year, was rewarded by being able to cook for his peers the next year. He was made the cook. Now think of the energy that goes into the meal that this august student will prepare for his peers compared to someone who's just bitter and slopping food around. The energy of the medication has an effect on us more than the actual ingredients. And in terms of allopathic drugs, Rudolf Steiner said, all these allopathic drugs which are substantial are effective energetically in the body. So I want to say that the body needs to be doing the healing. Now, I'm very excited about seed nutrition, and we have some products in booth 214 I'll tell you more about. But the, the owner of the company said, when I told him that his seed, his seed nutrition products were creating miracles, he said, no, no, no. Our seed products don't perform miracles. They just feed the human body optimally. And that allows the human body, which is the real miracle worker, to perform miracles. Only the body heals. Now, four solutions. Number one, in terms of oncoimmunology, I need you to read The Trial by Existence by Robert Frost. If you're not sure that you're a spiritual being, read that poem. I need you to be brave. I need you to listen to, um, what's her name? Um, Laura, what's her name? Sarah Bareilles. I need you to listen to this fabulous song about being brave. You need to, you need to understand that your most important state of mind is appreciation and gratitude. Keep death upon your shoulder because it reminds you to love. Now, don't fear cancer, but fear your oncologist. These are well-intended people, but they have, they have very blunt, bad tools. Now, God has an answering machine. If you ever call up God, the answering machine says, at the beep, please tell me who you are and what you want, if you can. Most people go through life unable to answer those questions. So if you can't answer God's answer machine and tell him who you are and what you want, you're not living fully, and you're giving the immune system the message to give up and recycle you. Live and love your life. Oop, I did something wrong there. Okay, love, right? Everybody knows this, right? Not just grandparents, but love is the way. Cancer is the laughing that has not been laughed. It's the weeping that has not been wept. You need to express yourself in this life. Now, a short history of oncoimmunology. In terms of history, in 2000 BC, here, eat this seed, and then the seeds heathen say this prayer, and then the prayer is superstition, drink this potion, and so forth. And finally, in 2017, it's eat the seed. Go back to the nutrition. Same thing with cancer. Started out with eating the seed, it ends up being Get rid of that chemo and radiation, it's ineffective. Take this immune stimulant and the anti-inflammatory. Now, um, we have whole crushed organic non-GMO seed drinks. We have molecular oxygen with DMSO in it. We have bioidentical progesterone. We have a lot of substances which can be very helpful as part of our protocols. But if you're not managing your state of mind, it's not gonna am amount to much. So to reintroduce oncoimmunology, it's really just taking care of your lifestyle and your health. It's psychoneuroimmunology, prayer, diet, nutrition, orthomolecular medicine. The immune system is very complex, but you don't have to worry about that. Just don't step on its foot. Just don't shoot yourself in the foot. We have protocols which are available online for people to look at. If you go to um, weeksmd.com, I don't want to take a lot of time to go through those, but there's probably another dozen things which are as effective. It really isn't so much what you eat, it's the spirit with which you eat. It's not what you take substantially, it's the spirit with which you accept it. This Calm Cream is an amazing product with seed oils in it and 75 milligrams per pump of progesterone. We have the Turbo 2, which is a molecular stabilized oxygen. And of course, uh, Otto Warburg said that cancer hates oxygen, so you need that. And then 
take a picture of this eventually and make sure that anybody you love who's getting treated for cancer has these inflammatory markers tested. You need to monitor the inflammation of the patients. This is kind of a throwaway, but a show of hands of people who still take fish oil. Stop that, stop that. Take only seed oils. The research is, is here. So what's wrong with this picture in terms of the solution? There's no seeds here. America's going to seedless grapes and seedless watermelon. Here's a typical meal, but what's missing? You're missing all the seeds. Did you know that you can eat the papaya a pit? Very bitter, very nutrient dense. The seed concentrates nutrients 30 times more than the rest of the flesh or the fruit. Don't throw away the seeds. The seed is the naturally occurring homeopathically prepared substance which solves the problem of how to reproduce itself and is the most nutrient dense and energetic food on earth. Why do you throw away the seeds? Last time you made watermelon, why'd you throw away the uh, watermelon seeds or lemonade? Why'd you throw away the lemon seeds? You need to freeze those and grind them up, but they have to be organic because the seed is the fat metabolism of the plant and all living organisms concentrate toxins like pesticides and herbicides in fat. The belly of the tuna has more mercury and so forth. So organic seeds. Seeds grow, this is pretty magical stuff. Seeds grow in the site of a wave compression. Physicists understand this. Seeds grow in the highest frequency that the plant experiences. And you can see that in, if, with an imagination. And you can see that these tiny trumpet antennae at the end of each seed are gathering in light. The seed is where the light forces are stored. And essentially folks, you're gonna find out eventually that we're only light beings. So eat light and eat life. Now, as a doctor for almost 30 years, I can tell you if things are not convenient, you human beings, you're not gonna do it. Compliance requires convenience. So these very simple two ounce packets of, uh, of these seed products, I usually have one on me, are very convenient. You need to have good seed nutrition. Now, in one packet of these products, you get eight ounces, uh, you get two ounces of um, nutrition, but it's the equivalent of eight servings of, orga of organic fruits and vegetables and three servings of cold pressed oils. We have detoxification seeds, we have protein rich seeds. Now, <laughs> if you're not learning about seeds, there's a lot of advantages, okay? But again, you have to eat organic non-GMO glyphosate free seeds. Now, in Genesis 129, and God said, behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. Now, I'm not a biblical scholar, but I read that as eat the seed for meat. That's your food, the seed. Mother Nature tricks us. She likes us to be sugar addicts and we eat the fruit and we throw away the seed. But eat the seed. So the solution number four is the solution number one. It's the same slide if you're paying attention. Sometimes I need to repeat myself. Manage your thoughts, be brave. Don't let doctors scare you. That's what's wonderful about this conference is lay people get together and create an environment where you're informed and the fear goes away. You have colleagues, many of us are cancer survivors and thrivers. So live and love your life. The glass is always half full. Now, um, Mark Twain said, I've been through many terrible things in my life, some of which actually happened. <laughs> and back in Rome, Seneca said, there are more things likely to frighten us than there are to crush us. We suffer more in our imagination than in reality. So the final thoughts to wrap up with. Cancer is not the enemy. This is a passage from Tom Robbins' novel, Half Asleep in Frog Pajamas. And uh, it talks about the magical Japanese doctor is saying, let's not fight cancer. My method is not warfare. My method is to pacify, to make friends with the tumor, make friendship with the cancer, change your friend's diet, teach your friend good manners. Number two, the oncologist is not your enemy. He or she is doing their best. Have compassion for them. I'm very fortunate for my mentors, like Otto Wolf and Linus Pauling. Linus said, do unto others 20% better than you would have them do unto you to correct for subjective error. <laughs> and Otto Wolf said, remember, Brad, to be a great doctor, you don't have to know anything. You just have to 
You just have to be willing to think. You guys are here thinking today. So the standard of care is suboptimal. People with cancer who accept the standard of care in oncology and who manage to survive, these people survive despite and not because of the treatment. Friends don't let friends get chemotherapy or radiation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. If anyone wants power, PowerPoint slides, email me. Brad, thank you so much for being here. And your booth number is, is it uh, 100, 101?